Today's lesson is from 1.3, Advanced Functions, Properties of Graphs of Functions. So it's going to be a little bit different lesson today because there's a lot of terminology and I didn't want to write it all out. So you can stop the video anytime you want and have a look at the notes that I'm going to be discussing with you. So key terminology, first of all, we have symmetry. Now you know what symmetry means, is something balanced, is it the same on each side? So you have different types of symmetry. You have line symmetry. If there is a line x equals a that divides a graph into two parts such that each part is a reflection of the other in the line x equals a, then you have line symmetry. And obviously the parabola would be the perfect example. You learned that in grade 10, the x of symmetry. Everything was the same distance between the x of symmetry, even if I drew it over here, right? So this has line symmetry. The other symmetry is point symmetry. So a cubic function, y equals x cubed, if you spin it around about this point right here, if you spin this around, then you would have the same graph, right? If I just brought this up here, it would look the very same as this part here. So a cubic function is an example of point symmetry. Point symmetry, the graph is symmetrical about a point AB. If each part of the graph on one side of AB can be rotated 180 degrees to coincide with point on the other side. So yes, this is point symmetry. Now, end behavior is something that you will have to describe um, many times in the grade 12 curriculum, so it's important that you understand this, and I have another little exercise we're going to do together a little bit later on. End behavior, what is happening to the graph as x approaches positive and negative infinity? So I'm talking about what happens as I go out this way and as I go out this way. So quite obviously for a parabola, as x approaches infinity, so as I go this way, y, or f at x, this part is also approaching positive infinity, right? It goes on. Remember these arrows mean it continues. As x approaches negative infinity, f at x also approaches positive infinity. So this is still going up, right? So the y's are getting higher. Or, I've got a little shorter version here, you could write, as x approaches plus or minus infinity, f at x approaches infinity. Okay, so um, intervals of increase and decrease now. So we have an interval within a function's domain where y values get larger moving from left to right is increasing. Opposite for decreasing, i.e. the y values get smaller. So in other words, what you're doing is as I start here, say I start here, I'm coming up from the bottom and going, I'm increasing, 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 increase. Then I hit a maximum value here. And after that, it's decreasing to here. So my increasing intervals would be from negative infinity to zero. It's neither increasing nor decreasing at that point. And then it decreases between zero and whatever this value is here. I think I wrote it as four. So it decreases from 0 to 4, and then it increases again from 4 to infinity. Now, the tricky part about writing these brackets, this is called interval notation. And that is that if you're using a round bracket, and I'll go into much more detail in a minute with that. If you're using round brackets, it means you're not including the end points of your interval. So I can't include negative infinity because negative infinity, it isn't a value, right? And negative infinity means the, the graph is taking arbitrarily large values. So because you have an arbitrary large value, you can't say it's called infinity. Infinity doesn't exist, okay? It just means it's getting really, really, really big negatively. So between negative infinity until I get to zero, but not at zero, because at zero the function is neither increasing nor decreasing. It has reached a maximum in this case. And the u here means union. So this just means union, which means I'm also including this interval, which is from four to positive infinity. The decreasing interval here is from zero 
x is an element of, remember this little e symbol means element of, x is an element of the values between 0 and 4, but not including 0 and not including 4. Okay, so on that theme, I'm going to go over some of the um, bracket interval notation that you will be using to describe intervals of increase and decrease. Now, in this case, it was printed out in black and white, which means we're going to have to color in what it actually means on the number line. So this said, the bracket interval is from A to B. The inequality would be X is between A and B. And the number line drawing would be, remember if it's um, increase or less than or greater than or not equal to, right? If it's equal to, it's a closed circle. So this is an open circle. This is an open circle and I'm between these two. So X is greater than A and less than B in words. Now if I have a round bracket and a square bracket, the square bracket again means less than or equal to in this case. It could be greater than or equal to if it was on the other end, like in this one. So now I have an open circle on A. It's not including A, but we go all the way down here to B and we include B. So that's why it's solid there. So that would be how you would draw it. X is greater than A and less than or equal to B. So let's go through this a little quicker now. So we've got a square bracket on this end and a round bracket at B and X is between these two values again. So like that. Now you can pause the video and take a look at this handout if you want to spend a little more time, but I'm just going to go through it quickly. So this one, we have two square brackets, which means we're including both the endpoints and all the points in between. This one shows A, is included and then x is greater than a which means it's going this way so to infinity so that's why there's a round bracket remember infinity you cannot put a square bracket on infinity from negative infinity and including a so this is just going the other direction so we have here and we have it going this way whoops i almost put that on there okay and this one Two round brackets, so not including the A value, but greater than. This pen's not working so well for me. And this one, it's going from, it's less than A. So less than means you leave an open circle and you go this way. Oh, it's really fading. Okay, and finally, negative infinity to positive infinity. So that's including an element of real numbers means everything. Right, so this is the entire number line in all directions. Okay, so that's all the possible intervals for real numbers um, between an A and a B value. Okay, so let's go back to, we finished this properties and we've done that. And now we're gonna look at this hand up here, which is talking about odd functions. A function that has rotational symmetry about the origin Okay, so we just talked about the cubic function by my pencil. And so for a cubic function, you have, it was hiding. If I take the cubic function and I cube negative 2, of course, that's going to give me negative 8. This is going to give me negative 1, 0, 1, and 8. So if I drew for you a cubic function, it would be 0, 0, 1, and 1. 2 and 8 so about like that so it's coming down like this and it's going to do the same thing on the other side so this would be y equals x cubed now in order for it to be odd now notice this line here about the origin and that is because if i said what would be um f at negative x is equal to the negative of f at x now that sounds a little confusing, but not if you watch carefully here. So let's say I was going to say, let's say x is 2. Is f at negative 2 equal to the negative of f at 2? Okay, so don't get confused. This is really quite simple. It just sounds weird. f at negative x is equal to the negative of f at x. So f at negative 2 is negative 8, 
right? So we have negative 8 on this side. And on this side, we have the negative of f at 2. And f at 2 is 8. So negative 8 equals negative 8. So that means it has odd um, symmetry. Okay, so it's odd, an odd function. Okay, so this means it's odd. Actually, it's kind of cool. I think that f at negative 2 is negative of f at 2. Now, this does not hold true if I had my cubic function over here, for instance. Oops, that's a really bad cubic function. So let's say I, I'm kind of going all the wrong way. Sorry, guys. It's been a long, hot summer day here. So I have it coming down like this and then like this. Okay, so you can see right away that f at, let's say this was 3, if I moved the cubic function over to the right 3, this would be the same thing as y equals x minus 3 cubed. You know that because you know your transformations. It shifted to the right 3 units. So if I plugged in, um, let's say 4, so f at 4 would be equal to 1, right? Because that would be 1 cubed. But f at negative 4 would be equal to minus 7 cubed, which I don't know off the top of my head, but it's not 1. So this is not odd. Okay, so be careful with that. It has to be symmetry about the origin, which you know is 0, 0. Right? So if, unless it's here, this isn't going to be odd. Okay, even functions. Functions whose graph are symmetrical about the y-axis. Now, we talked about uh, line symmetry. So you do know that a parabola has line symmetry. So if I drew a parabola like this, this would be an even function. Now, it would only be even if the only transformation we can apply to this would be to shift it up or down. So a vertical shift. So if I move my parabola up here, it's still an even function. Or if I put it down here, it would still be an even function. But if I moved it over here, that would not be because it's not about the y-axis. Okay, so even an odd has to be the origin, has to be the y-axis. Continuous functions are functions you can draw without lifting your pencil. That's the easiest way to describe it. Um, so something like if I had a graph like this and I drew square root function. Is that continuous? Yes, I drew it without lifting my pencil. It doesn't matter that I started here and there's nothing over there. It's continuous for x is greater than or equal to zero. Now, if I had a function that wasn't continuous, you did learn one in grade 11, and that was when you had a hole in the graph. Do you remember that? So if I have... Um, if I have a function that's going like this, and for some reason it wasn't defined right here, I had a hole, this would not be considered, not be continuous. Okay, so any holes in graphs, you don't see that too often, but sometimes you have seen them. And another one that wouldn't be continuous would be something like 1 over x, right? I really have to lift my pencil in order to drop both parts of that graph. So this is not continuous. So most polynomial functions are continuous, uh, the radical functions, exponential functions. So you have to get used to the idea of what is what is continuous, what isn't continuous. And you also will see um, on your test and in your homework exercises where they give you these different characteristics of functions and ask you um, which functions have the following characteristics. So you need to understand your your uh, parent functions really well. To that end, there is a homework assignment in the homework. It's uh, number 12 on 1.3, Properties of Graphs. I'm going to show it to you in two parts here so that you can freeze frame and have a look at it. So this would be something your teacher would probably ask you to fill in. It's a very important set of descriptors for the different functions. And we'll go over the list of maybe two or three of these, and then I'll let you take a look at it on your own time. Just pause, take a look, and make sure you understand the different characteristics. 
So let's do, let's do this one here first, 1 over x. People always hate that one because it's got so many complicated parts to it, like asymptotes, right? So what is the domain? x is an element of real numbers, x is not equal to 0, right? Can't be 0. The range, y is an element of real numbers, y is not equal to 0. Another asymptote here, right? That function has two asymptotes, a vertical and a horizontal. The intervals of increase, none. Why does that happen? Remember, when you're talking about intervals of increase, it's as you move from left to right. You can say, oh, no, it's increasing right there. See, it's going up. But no, you're reading from left to right. So this is going down. This is going down. As we move from x values getting larger or more to the left or this way, always down, down. So there's no intervals of increase. Uh, yeah, no, and intervals of decrease, it's decreasing from negative infinity. Notice the round bracket, negative infinity to zero. And you could put u here, zero to infinity. Now we have to break it at zero because it's neither increasing nor decreasing at the point x is zero because the graph doesn't exist there. Location of discontinuities and asymptotes. Okay, we've got that. X is equal to zero, Y is equal to zero. Those are simply the equations. Y equals zero, X equals zero. The equations of the asymptotes. There are no zeros. Remember zeros where you cross the X axis does not happen. The Y intercept does not cross the Y axis. The symmetry is point symmetry. Oh, I bet you wouldn't have guessed that. But if you look at this graph, if I, this is the point here about the origin, if I flip it all the way around, this would go over there, this would go over there, right? So point symmetry, and it would also be considered an odd function. Okay, and behaviors. So now I'm looking at what happens as x approaches infinity. So as x approaches infinity, y approaches zero, right? As I go this way, I'm approaching zero. As x approaches zero from the right. Now, this is something you probably didn't see before either. I don't know if you can read this tiny little writing of mine. Zero from the right. When you get your textbook in the fall, if you're there already or not, um, the solutions to this will also be in the back of the book, but this will give you a little head start. As x approaches 0 from the right, so as I approach 0 here from the right, that means I'm coming this way. So as I approach from the right, what's happening? Well, h of x approaches infinity. So that's what I've got here. As x approaches 0 from the right, y approaches infinity. As x approaches 0 from the left, now we're on this side here y approaches negative infinity. And I think I covered both of them here. As x approaches plus or minus infinity, y approach zero. Turning points, that's another thing that wasn't on this chart. I added it to my class's notes because turning point simply means where does a graph reach a max or min and change direction? So for instance, for this graph here, there would be your parabola. There's a turning point right here at zero, zero. So it goes down and then it goes back up. So that's, this one doesn't have a turning point. This one has one. This one doesn't have any. This has a turning point here. This doesn't have a turning point. This doesn't have a turning point. But the sine function, it has a turning point every 90 degrees. You reach the max, you go to a min, you go max and min, right? Okay, so maybe we'll look at, um, let's look at the exponential function. So p at x equals 2 to the x. Here's my graph. Goes through 0, 1. You should know that. Um, has an asymptote here, right? There's your exponential graph. You can plug in some values if you want. Remember that 2 to a negative 1 is a half. 2 to the negative 2 is a quarter. And on the other side, of course, you square it, or you cube it, you square it, you raise it to the fourth power. What is the domain? X is an element of real numbers. I can plug in any value I want. Um, what is the range? Well, 
y is greater than 0, not equal to, right? Greater than, it never crosses the, the x-axis. So y is greater than 0. Intervals of increase, remember, read from left to right. So as I go this way, it's going up. So it's increasing for all values of x, so negative infinity to positive infinity. And again, we just have these round brackets. Intervals of decrease, none. It doesn't go down. It's always increasing. That's why it's called an exponential growth function. Location of discontinuities and asymptotes. It has an asymptote here of y equals 0. You know that, y equals 0. If you can't remember if it's x or y, remember that on this axis, all y values. So if I said 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, everything is 0 for y. Does it have any zeros? No. doesn't cross the x-axis. Does it have a y-intercept? Yes, 1. In this case, it would be 0, 1. Symmetry? None. How sad. The end behaviors. As x approaches infinity, let's look at the graph again. As x approaches infinity, y approaches infinity. As x approaches negative infinity, can you see it? There, okay. As x approaches negative infinity, y approaches 0. So there we go like this. And there are no turning points. Okay, so I'll just scroll this really slowly back up to the top. So if you want to have a look at it and freeze frame and take a look at all the different properties for each of the graphs, then you can stop it on your own. And that's today's lesson. I hope that helps you out and gets you prepared for your um, Unit 1 test. Make sure you understand this very completely. When I do um, a test, I'll try to put in some examples.